Should we start? Oh, it's still yes. one minute to uh, go, right? Yes, um, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Topology Optimization Webinar. Today is our 22nd session, and it is kindly organized by Professor Michel Yersting and uh, Dr. Fabian Wein from the University of Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany. Michel, Fabian, thank you for organizing this session. Please take it over. You're welcome. Yeah, so also from my side, welcome uh, to that 22nd top webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, and maybe even happy uh, Thanksgiving, as we just found out. Uh, my name is Michael Stingli. We have organized this session with my team here at the Friedrich Alexander University of Erlangen. Special thanks goes to uh, my colleague Fabian Mein, who is at least on my screen just uh, below me, <laughs> and he did uh, actually most of the job. And of course, thanks to Jun, Matthias, uh, Fred, Nils, Ole for supporting us in setting that up. Uh, just a quick comment. The way we selected the presentations for today was that we simply asked members of our team which article appeared most interesting to them. And then we did a selection according to the various diversity criteria of this webinar. And as a, a, a result, we have not a topical session. But it's, it's more like a, a good mixture, let's say, with different topics like specialized design parametrizations, multi-physics applications, stability, and buckling, as well as handling of uncertainties. All in all, this sums up to five talks, each one with 12 plus three minutes, 12 for the presentation and three for immediate questions and some optional time for perhaps more general discussions at the end of the meeting. And with that, it is uh, my pleasure to announce already our first uh, speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Yi uh, Li. Um, he's a postdoc at the Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. And he's uh, especially interested in, in his research, uh, research in phononic and photonic crystals, metamaterials, uh, and uh, more generally in topology optimization of these uh, uh, objects and devices. Today, he's going to talk about the design of curvy linear variable stiffness composites, considering stiffness, strength, and manufacturability. The paper behind this presentation was co-authored uh, by uh, Hao Cheng Ding, Bin Zhu, and Jiadong Kuang. And uh, the paper appeared actually this year in the show model for structural and multidisciplinary optimization. So now I think I was a little bit quick. So question to the main organizers, do we still start or should we wait uh, precisely until five past four with the starting the first presentation, or do, do we simply go? Yeah, let's just go, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, so then please bye bye, the stage is all yours. Please uh, share your slides and start with your talk. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm sharing my slide. Okay, again, good everything to everyone. Thanks for attending this webinar. I am Wei Bai Li from Swinburne University of Technology, Melbourne, Australia. In this section, I will present our recent research on the design of curvilinear variable stiffness composites, considering stiffness, strength, and manufacturability. Uh, here's also the contents. Uh, firstly, I will introduce the research background of the uh, carbon fiber reinforced composites. Then I will demonstrate the mathematical uh, formulation of the optimization problem, followed by some numerical examples and conclusions will be drawn at last. Okay. Mm, composites, especially the fiber reinforced composites, are extensively used because of their excellent properties, such as significant stiffness and high strength. For example, if you are interested in football, you may find that the South Korean captain, Sun Hin Min, has committed to wearing a carbon fiber reinforced mask as a protective measure after suffering a facial injury. The mask is designed to shield the facial bones from uh, impact, thus minimizing the risk of further injury. I hope we can see him in the match against Uruguay, starting about one hour later. And currently, 
the uses of composites in aircraft, such as in the Boeing seven, uh, B7A7, has reached a 50 percentage. And the number of composites used in other military and civil aircraft are also increasing yearly. However, utilizing the benefits of composites requires careful design and optimization. Uh, the development of advanced manufacturing techniques, for, uh, for instance, the continuous carbon fiber 3D printing and the automated fiber uh, placement has made it possible to manufacture composites with curvilinear fiber pads. The ability of uh, variable angled hole placement in place structures is an active field of research where the motivation is to improve the performance by spatially varying the fiber orientation within apply, such as maximizing the stiffness or buckling performance. Uh, however, unreasonable placement paths will lead to poor quality consistence of fiber components. Uh, thus, we need to, uh, we have some considerations in the uh, design. So, uh, the first manufacturing constraint for variable stiffness laminates is the minimum turning radius of the fibers. This constraint prevents buckle, uh, fiber buckling due to the compressive forces within a toe when steering. Uh, if the turning radius is too small, the inner toe turns to a uh, weak out of plane, which leads to imperfection and degrades the structural low carrying capability. Uh, as shown on this graph, uh, we use X and Y to denote the Cartesian coordinates and a 2D unit vector field V is defined by the toe angle distribution theta. And W is the implant unit normal vector to the fiber pass. Uh, we have this equation states the curl of the vector. Uh, it, it is the directional derivative of the angle theta in the tangential direction, which is the definition of the curvature for a parametric curve And the second manufacturing constraint is parallelism. The fiber paths are required to be parallel and equally spaced. Uh, if this requirement is not satisfied, gaps or overlaps between neighboring fiber toes will appear, which leads to undesired thickness variation of the laminates. Uh, so according to this uh, equation, we can know that the divergence of the vector field V defined as per psi is proportional to the uh, angle difference of two neighboring fiber pairs. So uh, when this function per psi is greater than zero, that means a gap is likely to form. Otherwise, when per psi is smaller than zero, then uh, the overlap is likely to occur. Uh, so these constraints has, uh, have already been proved uh, to be uh, useful in practice. So we apply these constraint formulations in the optimization design of curvilinear fiber paths. And notice that both constraints for the curvature and for the uh, parallelism are functions of the local fiber angle, theta. Um, therefore, uh, we propose a new uh, parameterization uh, of the uh, angle, uh, angle variable field based on the normalized capacity supported radius basis functions. That is the CSRBFS. So this function is continuous and differentiable uh, in the whole domain. Uh, the field mapping can be expressed as this equation, where the theta i is the uh, angle we're labeled in the supported point of the CSRBFS and theta i is the angle we're labeled at one element center. And xc and pi denotes the coordinate of the support point and the element center respectively. So the obtained the fiber angle vector field uh, can be easily post-processed as streamlines to present the fiber paths uh, such as using the software Teleport or MetaLab. 
Uh, then the uh, compliance minimization problem with strength and manufacturing constraints under uh, the failure analysis framework is established. Uh, the failure index can be divided from the child failure criterion. And uh, we have uh, two manufacturing constraints uh, concerning the curvature and the parallelism. Uh, we have the subscript C here indicates the corresponding value in each element. And we apply the PLOM approach to, uh, to integrate the uh, elemental constraint values into their global forms. And let's, let's uh, see some numerical examples. Uh, the mechanical properties uh, applied in our numerical examples are listed in this table. And this example investigate an L-shaped plate subject to an out-of-plane uh, load. So we have uh, 1,850 even, uh, evenly distributed support points here. So the design variables are located on the points. And the initial design is that all angle variable values associated with the support points are set to zero. And we have uh, five models subject to different combinations of the objective and the constraints. So uh, firstly, we compute the optimization for the stiffness design, where the objective is to uh, minimize the compliance with or without constraints. And this uh, here shows the uh, optimized fiber pairs the distribution of uh, kappa and the distribution of psi, that is the constraint factors. And uh, from this uh, optimized results, we can see uh, this uh, the red arrow here with the number one here means the uh, here uh, is the position a gap is likely to exist. And uh, here number two is the position the overlap uh, may occur. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, can you see the table here? Uh, we have uh, two results for the model C means uh, only minimizing the compliance. CM mean, uh, means uh, uh, minimizing compliance with the uh, manufacturing constraints. And uh, we can see this one has a smaller compliance but both the manufacturing factors uh, exceed our given values. And CM here has a slightly larger result, but both uh, these uh, factors uh, satisfy our constraints. And next, we compute the optimization for the strength design. Again, we have uh, the uh, model with without with uh, constraints and with constraints. And here, number again, number one, the potential gaps. Number two, the potential overlaps. And the red circle here means uh, the, uh, the turning radius of the fiber pass is too small here. So the top region may have a too small turning radius. And again, in comparison uh, with the result uh, without manufacturing constraint, uh, this design has a slightly uh, higher failure index as 0 0.53, but both uh, manufacturing constraints are satisfied. And next, we make a comparison between the stiffness design and the strength design. Uh, although both designs satisfy the uh, manufacturing constraint here, but uh, the optimized fiber paths are significantly different, uh, to, different to each other. The CM design has a much smaller compliance, but the maximum failure index here is as large as 2.93. When it is uh, exceeds one, that means there uh, may be a strength failure occur at this location. So the last, okay. 
the last model minimizes the compliance while satisfying the strength and uh, also the manufacturing requirements. The optimized result shows similar characteristics to the one of strain design on the top side here. And the bottom side, it fits the, uh, just like the stiffness design. Uh, that means this optimized design achieves a balance between the stiffness and strength. Uh, this one, number E, that is the uh, uh, optimized design uh, considering all the factors. Uh, so at last, uh, we get, draw some conclusions. We uh, we propose a par uh, parameterization angle variable scheme based on the normalized CSRBFS, which ensures the local fiber angle continuity and the bound of the design variables. And the pure design, uh, pure stiffness design does not satisfy the manufacturing uh, requirements. And the optimized structure is sometimes the most likely to fail. That is why we uh, want to uh, apply the manufacturer uh, manufacturability uh, while doing the optimization. And without the strength constraints, uh, the strength uh, failure index of these corners may exceed the safety level. So this situation can be avoided in our final CSM optimized design. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice uh, presentation. Perfectly in time, which means that uh, we have uh, a couple of minutes for questions, for direct questions. There so is already the one. Michael, the first is in the chat. Yeah, I can see it. It's it's by Johannes Neumann. I, I will simply read it. So very interesting. Thanks a lot. What kind of path generator approaches did you consider? Pass tracers, while also other methods, e.g. isolines of some derived scalar field. Uh, pardon? <laughs> can, can, can you, you can uh, see the question in the chat. Maybe. Okay. I just read it for everybody. Uh, let me, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, you oh you are talking about the ISO lines. Oh, actually, uh, first we uh, we choose the uh, fiber angle as the design variables. So in our optimized design, actually we get a uh, uh, a vector of the fiber angle. Then we use the post process. Uh, actually, just like the streamline. Uh, we so uh, we go back to this slide. But this one. Okay. Okay. I think uh, this satisfies. So, for example, we have uh, uh, many support points, and the uh, angle here. So we have uh, many. Uh, a, a, a vector of the angles. So the fiber angles can be converted to the fiber pass here, just using like the streamline command in MATLAB. I don't know, Johannes, if this answers your question. Uh, yes, thank you. That worked very much. Uh, basically, I was uh, asking because you can also include the manufacturing constraints po potentially in, the, in this post-processing step, right? Some degree. Ah, yes, post process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was my question. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Then maybe there's another question we can quickly take by Yun. So he's asking uh, for the spacing between the curve, uh, and he observed that they are not, this is not constant. So do you have danger and uh, other regions? Uh, and the question is does the manufacturing process allow this, that you still have some variation in the spacing? <laughs> huh? Do you see the question? Uh, I can't see the question. Which one? Oh, the it, second question. Oh, it? I can see yeah. it. 
I saw the spacing between the curves is not constant. Ah, yes, there are a lot of constants. Does the manufacturing allow this? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, the automated, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, this one, we, we can see this automated fiber placement. By this technique, we can have uh, the variable stiffness decide. That means the uh, variable angle uh, of the fiber toe. So uh, yes, the manufacturing process allow this. Does it? Does this mean yeah, the fiber? Are... Sorry. Does this mean the fiber can have different thickness and change continuously? No, no, no. They have they have the same uh, they have the same thickness, but different uh, distance. Okay. Because uh, the spacing, the spacing between the curves, it means here, yeah. the spacing here is not constant. Okay. Yeah, I, I will talk to you later. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think in the interest uh, of time, we postpone further questions to the discussion at the end of this uh, webinar and we move on to the second speaker. So maybe, uh, if you can stop sharing your slides, uh, yep. then I will announce the second speaker, okay. uh, which is uh, Carl Johan Torre. He's a senior associate professor at the Division of Solid Mechanics at the Linköping University in Sweden. Uh, and in his uh, research, he has a special focus uh, on robust topology optimization and uh, also the design of active structures. Today, he's going to present a paper with the title Topology Optimization for Minimum Temperature with Mass Flow and Stiffness Constraint. The paper was co-authored by Jonas and Jan-Erik Lundgren, as well as Anders Glabring, and appeared in Computer Methods in Applied Mechanics and Engineering also uh, this year. And with that, I would already hand over to Carl Johan. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, so I hope everyone can uh, can see my screen. Yes, yes, it's it can be seen. Yes. It, it's not full screen yet, so maybe. Oh, okay. Is it full I, screen I, now? Yeah, maybe, maybe you have it in in the wrong way now because we see now the 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 presenters view. Ah, uh -huh, okay. I have. Uh, so you have to switch the screens, I guess. Two screens uh, attached. Maybe I can. Do you touch the second screen? Sorry, I would. So now it's all fine. Okay, now you see the, the main PowerPoint here. Okay, great. You do. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's an, an honor to be invited to, to speak in this forum. Uh, the motivation for this work comes from the desire to design cooling solutions for gas turbine components. Uh, and in the picture here, you see an industrial gas turbine. It's quite a big thing. And in here, you have a lot of components that are uh, subject to extreme temperatures. So more than 1000 degrees uh, easily. Uh, and we focused on uh, so-called guide vanes. So these are wing-like structures situated in between the turbine blades to guide hot gas onto the blades, causing them to rotate, and that will drive the axle to which you can attach an electricity generator. Uh, now, the guide vanes are subjected to extreme temperatures on the side here, so they need efficient cooling in order to simply not melt down. Uh, and you have cooling air coming in from above here, and then it can exit in the leading edge via small holes here, generating- uh, Kali Wuhan, sorry to interrupt, but maybe it's only my problem. I can't see you. You're obviously pointing to something and I can't see yeah. a mouse pointer. Is, the, is that also the uh -huh. case for the others? It would be very <laughs> useful if you could see it. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, why can't you see that one? Uh, um, where is the mouse? So sorry for the technical issues here. 
Mm. Now the laser pointer is there. Oh, now, now we see something. We can see it, yeah. <laughs> and now it's not moving. Uh, yeah. So let, let me see if I can, maybe I can bring up the, uh, instead the uh, uh, PDF version of this one. Mm. Yeah, it's better if I stop share and then I share the PDF instead. Um, Let's try. Okay, can you see the PDF? Yes, and also the hand is there. Okay, great, great. Um, full screen mode. Okay, oh. yeah. <laughs> Terribly sorry for the technical issues. Okay, now I hope you can see the uh, the slides and the, the hand there. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, our focus for this work was cooling of guide veins. Uh, and you have cooling air coming from the top, exiting in holes via the leading edge, creating a thin surface here, which isolates the outer surface. Uh, that's called shower head cooling. That was not modeled in this work. Uh, instead, we focused on internal cooling via channels leading from the inlet through the structure and out via the trailing edge. Uh, and the optimization problem then is to uh, try to design these cooling channels so as to minimize some measure of the temperature on the outer shell, while at the same time not using too much cooling medium hence the uh, mass flow constraints. In addition, we also have uh, mechanical stiffness constraints. So moving on to the problem data, starting with uh, the geometry, we were given a uh, uh, quite a complex geometry, which is fairly representative of what you see in a real uh, gas turbine uh, component. The outer shell here was considered given, by aerodynamic requirements, for example, and we did topology optimization on the interior of this model. Uh, it's a bit, uh, we did mesh this one in hypermesh and did a bit of topology optimization, but it's quite difficult to work with this geometry. So we have done much more work on a rectangular domain here, which retains the, the uh, roughly the overall size of the actual gas turbine. And it also has a uh, quite a thin outlet region in the back. Uh, we have also, of course, done a lot of work on various 2D representations of this problem, which is, are attractive because they can be solved very fast. Um, okay, as for the material and boundary condition, the cooling medium is uh, compressed air, and it is, uh, has a pressure of around 400 kilopascals uh, on the inlet, varying depending on where you are in the, in the gas turbine. Uh, the flow of hot gas on the sides is not modeled in detail. Instead, we have a simple uh, stationary convection diffusion temperature problem with a convection boundary condition like that. Uh, we have prescribed temperature on the inlet and uh, uh, isolated uh, outlet and bottom. Uh, these are not the most realistic boundary condition you could imagine, but we thought that they would work well for our sort of initial tests. Uh, from a mechanical point of view, uh, you have loading coming from the relative movement of the bottom and the top, more or less prescribed displacement on the top edge here. And most importantly, perhaps you have uh, thermal expansion loading. <clears throat> okay, we uh, uh, use a standard density based um, topology optimization for this and the simulation. Problem uh, consists of a coupled flow, thermal, and uh, mechanical problem. Uh, the mechanical problem is quite uh, straightforward. Standard stationary linear elasticity of a design dependent load from the thermal expansion. Uh, but other than that, this is a very well, well 
behaved problem that we solved successfully uh, with G, uh, conjugate gradients on the GPU. Uh, so let's talk more about the flow and temperature problem, starting with the flow here, which is perhaps the most uh, interesting, uh, challenging, and maybe controversial aspect of this work. Uh, so in modeling the uh, flow of internal cooling medium, we can uh, choose between uh, a lot of different models with varying degrees of complexity. And we thought that, that maybe the Stokes flow model uh, is a good compromise between accuracy or physical realism and computational cost. And that is something that you can debate and something that we are continuously looking into. Anyway, you see here uh, the weak form of the incompressible Brinkman-Stokes equations, where the first term uh, in the variational equation, there is the uh, Brinkman penalty term, which penalizes flow in solid region. It's a very commonly used uh, method of introducing uh, topology optimization in flow problems. Uh, I want to highlight uh, that we do not have prescribed velocity on the inlet, which is quite common. Instead, we have prescribed traction. The advantage is that the optimization solver can itself decide where to place uh, inlet holes, for example. Uh, and it is also, of course, the most realistic boundary condition in this case. Uh, as for the discretization, we have worked mainly with uh, Q1, uh, so trilinear velocity only formulation. Uh, with penalty to enforce roughly incompressibility for large lambda there and reduced integration to avoid locking. Uh, and this is a good and fast method for 2D and for perhaps for medium scale 3D, but eventually you have to have a method that can be solved with iterative linear solvers. Uh, so we have been worked with a somewhat non-standard method. It's the Q1, Q0, so element-wise constant pressure with pressure jump stabilization needed to avoid, for example, uh, pressure instabilities, as you see here. Uh, OK, as for the thermal problem, it's a stationary convection diffusion problem uh, standard. You have the velocity from the flow problem coming in there. Uh, when we discretize, we run the risk of uh, uh, instabilities, such as the uh, oscillations in the temperature field seen in this uh, close up view here. So you have to have some form of, of stabilization. OK, uh, as for the uh, optimization problem, then um, we uh, minimize uh, the average temperature, you could say, on the outer shell. So gamma alpha t is the sides here. It's the leading edge and part of the trailing edge. Uh, here is the mass flow over the inlet boundary, which we uh, limit. And finally, we have a mechanical compliance bound, uh, where this is the compliance from the thermal uh, expansion load, and this is from the uh, prescribed displacements. Uh, and in the paper, and this was a big part of the paper, which I'm not going to talk about, we showed existence of solutions to this problem, and we have also shown a finite element convergence for a, a related problem in, in another publication. Um, so for the numerical example, we exploited the uh, uh, symmetry here. We used uh, MMA. We solved the uh, small scale problems in, in MATLAB, small scale because you can't parallelize with, with MPI, for example. Uh, but we have been working on a PETC implementation, which will allow us to attack a fairly large scale problems. It's just a matter of getting enough time on the supercomputer. Uh, OK, anyway, here's uh, an example of the type of results that we saw. So uh, recall that we are exploiting symmetries. You see one half of the design. And you see an inlet hole up here. And you have uh, uh, channels going through the solid material. And if we scale away the solid material, we can see a network of smaller channels nearer to the uh, outer edge on the, on the back here. Uh, we did some parametric studies, fixing the mass flow bound and varying the, uh, 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 the weight on, on stiffness. Uh, in addition, we saw another funny phenomenon observed in, uh, in other uh, formulation, problem formulations as well, namely the formation of islands. So these are freely floating parts, not connected to the main structure or support, so not manufacturable. 
but an efficient way to stop the mass flow. So we're, we're working on that. Uh, yeah, you can also see some, some even higher resolution 3D versions done uh, after the paper was published. Uh, here's an example of what you can do in 2D. And I think that this is as fine as you can go because if the channels get any smaller, uh, less than let's say one millimeter in a diameter, you run the risk of uh, getting clogged by uh, soot or dust particles. For practical reasons, you can't have smaller uh, channels than that. Uh, we have been uh, done a bit of 3D printing so far just for visualization and, and to test that it could be printed at all. During the spring, we hope to do uh, plastic prints in which you can test the flow properties. Uh, we have been doing a bit of CFD validation as well, importing post-processing and importing designs into console and star CCM and, and uh, compared with stationary neighbor stokes and turbulence uh, model uh, as well. And validation is something that we're continuing on. It's quite obvious that you need higher resolution than, the, than, than what we had in the article. And that is something that we have also achieved since then. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. A very impressive uh, work. Uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, but as this is due to these technical issues, we still should, I think, take uh, accept a short delay and take a, a couple of questions. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any please raise your hand? If not, I have actually a, a sort of very mathematical questions. You mentioned this this weak star uh, convergence, yeah. but you also mentioned that you are using filters. So, so is this yeah. somehow to the, the, the due to the nature of the more much more complex state problem that you don't get stronger convergence? Because typically, if you have filter. You, yeah. you, you want to have stronger convergence, right? Then yeah, weak yeah. Uh, the, the weak star convergence concerns the optimization variable rho. The filter yeah. variable will converge. It will at least converge point-wise. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you have strong... And that's your design, actually, the filtered one, right? So so that's then okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. That answers the question. Thank you. There's another one in the chat, I guess. There are even two. Fabian Wein is asking for a uh, finer resolution. If, if the objective is increasing, if you have a finer resolution, is the question? Uh, yeah, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure what would happen. I mean, I mean, if you increase the resolution in the design problem, you, then you have more de design degrees of freedom. So in, in a way you could find better designs. Okay. And then not, maybe we, yeah. hmm? sorry, didn't want to interrupt. No, okay. I, I'm not entirely sure I, I understand the, uh, okay. the question. Okay. So maybe we take a last one for now. This is by Ahmad and he is asking um, did you consider any pressure constraints? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean in the state problem we have prescribed uh, traction on the inlets, so pressure roughly. Uh, but we have worked with an alternative formulation where you instead prescribe the mass flow here and then you compute the reaction uh, pressure and constrain that to some, some reasonable level. So that is uh, an alternative formulation that we have been working with uh, and which might be more attractive if you have a more advanced flow model, I could imagine, because mass flow or velocity constraints uh, tend to yield easier convergence for such models. So that's something that we have been thinking about. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So thank you again, Kaliwan, for the nice presentation and also answering all our questions. And in the interest of time, we are moving on to the next uh, presentation. So if you stop sharing, thank you. Thank our you next speaker is Yakov uh, Seligman. Uh, Yakov is currently postdoc at the John Hopkins University in the USA in the group of, of Jamie Guest. And uh, before that, he did his PhD with uh, Odette Amir at the Technion, 
and Oret is also in the audience, is going to talk about uh, optimization of plate supports using a feature mapping approach with techniques to avoid local minima. And that is a paper which was actually part of Jakob's PhD project, and it is co-authored by Odit Amir and appeared uh, also instructional and uh, multidisciplinary optimization in 2022. And with that, I would already hand over to you, Jakob. Please go ahead. Ah, slides are coming up. Perfect. Uh, we can't hear you yet. I don't know yeah, if you're I'm already... sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can you see the yeah, slides? Perfect. Yeah, All right. everything fine. So thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to share our work here. Um so Supports have, we all know it has a uh, great influence on structural performance of structures. And it was already established quite some time ago that for reason, at least for a minimum compliance problem, the optimal location of supports is such that the uh, gradient of the deflection surface is zero at the supports. And the existing methods or existing work to try to optimize the location of supports are measure dependent, which might cause, uh, might be computationally expensive and uh, might be also prone to converge to local minimum. Um, so in this study, we try to separate the design space from the analysis space, and uh, uh, this will lead to non measure dependency and hopefully we reduce the sensitivity to convergence to local minimum. So the basic idea is take the uh, support stiffness and project it on the uh, finite element model of the plate, where we project it over uh, X circle that are defined by the dimensions of the support itself, where in order to maintain the, the smoothness of the model, we approximate this uh, projection using a radial super Gaussian function. And therefore, from a mathematical perspective, the stiffness of single support is projected on all nodes of the of the plate model, and thus leading to uh, equivalent stiffness matrix of the of, of, of its support, which then are added up to the stiffness matrix of the plate itself to generate the to obtain the stiffness matrix of the supported plate. So the optimization is quite straightforward. We you know, design variables are the coordinates of the supports and the formulation. It will minimize the compliance with only box constraints that may be a design dependent in the case that we have played with a, with a strange geometries. The, uh, the uh, sensitivity analysis of the compliance is, is simple. I just want to mention that eventually it ends up to be a weighted sum where the weights are the derivatives of the stiffness projection um, weights with respect to the design variable, multiplying some kind of null pseudo compliances. This is how I call those. And I'll get back to this expression in a few slides. And so on simple problems, it works good. Here you see optimization of, of a four supports supporting a, a square floor. It converges uh, quickly. And if you compare this uh, layout to a uh, manually inve investigated design space, uh, if possible, that it found the global optimum. And uh, however, uh, it's not uh, it's not always like this. And more complicated uh, problems, for example, simply by adding fifth support to this problem, we see that the optimization is very sensitive to converging to local minimum. Uh, this was recently attributed to the fact that the parameterization is, is rather compact, especially if you compare it, to, for example, to density-based optimizations. So in order to demonstrate this, what we did, we uh, optimized this problem 100 times, each time with different uh, initial design that were randomly generated. And here you can see uh, on the plot the values of the optimized compliance, and you can see they're uh, spread all over the place, implying a convergence to local minimum. And in fact, we identify here three different uh, um, local minimums with uh, some noise around them, where the better optimum is this X layout of the supports, where the optimization managed to converge to this layout 
approximately this layout in 26 percent of the cases or in 26 out of 100 or out of 100 trials and we try to improve the points of the optimization in this regard and let's take a look at the uh, derivatives so i mentioned that the derivatives are this weighted sum where the weights are uh, the, are the summation weights are the derivatives of the stiffest projection uh, factors and in fact, these summation weights have non-zero values only along the boundaries of the projection area. And this means that the design is governed eventually only by the deflections along those deflection along those uh, boundaries. And even if we take a closer look at this, we see that opposing nodes uh, with respect to the support have the same value of the summation weight with different uh, sign. And if we take, uh, uh, for example, a state along the optimization where the uh, deflection surface has non-zero gradient above the support. In this case, the derivative will be positive and the support will move to the left, eventually uh, getting to a point where the uh, gradient of the deflection surface is, is uh, zero and the derivative will be also zero, implying that the optimization managed to find extra local minimum of the problem. Um, however, when the projection radius is, is getting smaller and smaller, the derivative also approaches zero, even if this uh, gradient of the deflection surface is not zero. Therefore, uh, it's possible that the optimization will be terminated before reaching to actual local minimum. And we uh, think that this is the reason for the noise we saw in, in the results. So in order to, to, uh, to improve the performance in this regard, we suggest uh, um, simultaneous continuation of the projection radius, meaning we uh, increase simultaneously the projection radius of all supports and then gradually uh, decrease it, where the idea is that to, to uh, um, <clears throat> allow the optimization to find a real local minimum of the of the support location. And yeah, and additionally, we uh, suggest another continuation scheme, which is differential continuation, where the idea is that the projection radius of each support is enlarged separately. And this takes advantage of the fact that uh, this design is governed by the deflections along those influence rings. So hopefully it might help optimization to pull out supports that are stuck in, in, in the local minimum. And then we stack those two um, uh, schemes into three-step continuation, starting with simultaneous, uh, then differential, and at the end, another simultaneous continuation. And here in this clip, you see uh, this uh, uh, five support example. You see how the project tries to find this uh, better optimum and eventually managed to find it. And you can see the circles represent the projection area that uh, eventually reduces to the dimensions of the support themselves. Uh, in addition, we uh, also uh, kind of uh, simply try to start with a good initial design, which is always a good practice. In the context of this problem, it means we uh, don't want uh, the supports to be clustered at the beginning of the optimization. And we uh, <clears throat> achieve this by demanding that the maximum deflection at the initial design will be less than some fraction of the dimension of the plate itself. Obviously, different. the notion of the good initial design is different for every problem. In addition to this, we saw that um, the supports very quickly go to the uh, external uh, external uh, regions of the plate to reduce the deflections at the cantilevers and therefore leaving the internal regions uh, unsupported, which not always uh, uh, leads to uh, to good optimum. So we also added a relaxation on the derivatives, kind of soften this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this behavior. So let's see how this affects the um, of the optimization. If we impose only a control over the initial design, so you see this plot, you see here two sets of points, blue points, which represent the reference results obtained simply with a random initial design. And the orange uh, circles represent the results if we only post control of initial design. And you can see that uh, it's, they're still scattered, but possibly less. And the optimization managed to converge to the better optimum in 35% of the cases. When we add to this also um, a single, a simultaneous continuation with a single step, meaning we uh, reduce it simultaneously throughout the optimization. We see that the optimization managed to converge steadily to local minimums. 
and thus eliminating the, uh, the noise. And even the, uh, it managed to convert to the better optimum in 47% of the cases. When we uh, implement a three-step continuation, this number increases to 96%. And when we add to this also the relaxation of the derivatives, it reaches 100% convergence to the better optimum, uh, possibly in this case, convergence to the global optimum of this, of this problem and effectively eliminating the dependence on the initial design. Um, in a different example, we find uh, uh, similar trends. Uh, however, I want to emphasize that this does not mean that this, uh, this uh, method guarantees convergence to global optimum or even guarantees convergence to, uh, to, uh, to the same optimum regardless of the initial design. Uh, however, it, it does improve the performance in this regard quite significantly. <laughs> More about this uh, example, it's uh, interesting to see that uh, the, better, uh, the better design in this, in this uh, problem actually is, has non-symmetric layout of support, which is kind of surprising and uh, means that uh, our intuition not always works as we hoped it would be. Interestingly, the method also is not sensitive to the, uh, to the mesh resolution um, as we intended it to be. And this means that the optimal location of the layer of the supports is not is, is quite the same regardless of the, of the mesh resolution, and uh, which can be uh, used for very efficient optimization of the supports. And finally, uh, what we try to do this in, in, a, in an upcoming paper, we try to optimize the location of columns of, of uh, concrete floors to reduce the amount of concrete. In this case, we uh, use the geometry for paper by Matthew Gilbert, and we and the formulation is changed to for minimization of the volume with constraints on the deflections and, and bending moment and shear constraints. And interestingly, we see that the uh, thickness of the plate is very sensitive to the exact column location, meaning that even slight uh, changes in the column location will result in significant reduction in amount of consumed concrete, which is uh, interesting and uh, kind of promising. Yeah, and uh, I want to thank you for the attention. And I don't know if we have time, but I would be happy to take questions now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, uh, very interesting presentation. Is there any immediate question? Again, we are a couple of minutes behind schedule, but we take another two or three questions for sure. I don't see an immediate answer. So can I ask, if, or, or is there one? I, I heard someone. Uh -huh. Fabian is has a question on the chat. He's asking, how do you do the integration? Um, the integration done uh, with um, with a Gauss quadrature when we use a quite dense uh, quadrature with thirty six points per element. Mm -hmm. Does it okay. answer the question? Yes. Yeah, it seems to. Uh, Maybe another question is so you you refine the resolution right, but this is not does not result in in a in a larger design space somehow. So so how do you feel about your all these nice strategies by which you single out the local minima when you go like let's say to fifty or one hundred uh, design uh, elements? So. Um... The, the, the design variables are the coordinates of the of the supports, yeah, not the densities. Sure. So if uh, the, I solve the largest solve with the you know, 35, 36 uh, supports, and it seems to work the same, so it's kind of not very sensitive to the amount of, of supports. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I went only as far as 30-something supports, so I'm interested to see what happens if we have hundreds of them. Yeah, yeah, but maybe it also doesn't make too much sense, right, to have too many <laughs> in practice. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's another question. Let's take a last one from uh, Ahmad again, and he's asking: uh, in structural problems like those you presented, loads are not usually deterministic. Do you plan to use any uncertainty in your optimization problem? Um, so, Ahmad, thanks for the question. I. Uh... I haven't considered this specifically, but for sure it's a very interesting uh, uh, way to go further. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Also, we will have a talk uh, uh, related to that question in the end, but of, of, for, for different design, of course. Okay. Thanks again, Jakob. Very nice uh, presentation. And thanks for answering all our questions.
questions and we move on to the fourth uh, speaker in this session which is uh, Anna Dalkind, and uh, Anna is a PhD student of Matthias Wallin at the Lund University in Sweden with a special interest in topology optimized stable structures and this is also seen in the title of her paper which is on structural stability and artificial buckling modes in topology optimization. That paper was co-authored uh, by Matthias Wallin and uh, Dan Tortorelli and appeared uh, in structural and multidisciplinary optimization in 2021. Yeah, with that, I hand over to you. Anna, please go ahead. The stage is all yours. Yeah, okay. So you can hear me, I guess. Yeah, everything yeah. is fine. So thank you for the introduction. As uh, mentioned, my name is Anna and today I will talk a bit about buckling and nonlinear hyperelasticity and uh, all of this in combination with topology optimization. So jumping right in, right? we can first consider a structural system which has a low displacement behavior as you see in this graph here. Then we can, for any equilibrium uh, position along this graph, quantify whether it's unstable or an unstable equilibrium position by monitoring the uh, eigenvalues of the tangent stiffness matrix in that position. Since if we are in a stable equilibrium position, we require that the potential has a local isolated minima, which is equivalent to that the tangent stiffness matrix must be positive definite. On the other hand, if uh, we are in an unstable equilibrium position, then at least one eigenvalue of the tangent stiffness matrix will become negative. And so to transition between these two um, equilibrium uh, or uh, um, between an unstable and an unstable equilibrium position, we must pass a so-called critical point in which at least one uh, eigenvalue of the tangent stiffness matrix vanishes, which can be uh, quantified by the equation that we see here below, which is an eigenvalue problem where the right-hand side then has vanished. So phi j, uh, j here are then the Buckley mode shapes uh, in that critical uh, point. So uh, there are applications there are applications where uh, these critical points uh, might, uh, you might want to take advantage of these critical points and the unstable uh, behavior that might come with them. For example, if you wanted to uh, design an energy trapping device or any other type of exotic programmable uh, device, then you might wanna uh, utilize these uh, uh, critical points uh, to, uh, uh, to design this uh, type of device. But in most cases, when designing structural components, you would rather want to have a certain safety uh, against buckling such that you know that when the, this uh, structure is operating uh, at its uh, designed uh, um, uh, conditions, then it should uh, not be near an unstable or a critical point such that we avoid this uh, unpredictable behavior that comes with an unstable equilibrium position. So in either way, we have to somehow uh, compute where these critical points are along the low displacement graph. And in this work, we embrace the so-called linear buckling approach, which actually works both for linear elasticity and finite strains, uh, and can uh, also be appointed the one point approach. But in this approach, we assume that we have loaded our structure up to uh, operating loading conditions denoted by lambda OP here. And in this uh, configuration, we want to know how much we, will, uh, we have to scale our load before we find the first critical uh, uh, point. And this then is done by introducing a linearization of the tangent stiffness matrix in this position. Uh, such that it is decomposed into a constant part and one stress-dependent part, uh, which we assume this depend linearly on the load level. So this linearity is uh, described by the variable pi j here. Uh, the next question, of course, then is how we find these pi j's. Well, we insert our linearization into our critical point equation that we had here and rearrange to find this generalized eigenvalue problem, which can be then solved for the eigenvalues and eigenmodes, which are the so-called buckling load factors and uh, associated buckling uh, mode shapes then. And then we find uh, the, uh, the critical load by searching for the smallest eigenvalue, pi j here, and simply scaling uh, our operating load to find the first critical load. 
So this approach uh, actually works for uh, linear elastic assumptions and might be justified in the case that I show you here, since the behavior here initially is pretty linear, but this is not a general conclusion. So in this work, we embrace a fully nonlinear hyperelastic framework to be able to deal with uh, finite deformations before the critical um, uh, point and uh, non other nonlinear behaviors. And also we um, uh, introduce a compressible near hookian material model to model uh, our solid. So as the title says, we uh, employ a topology optimization uh, or a density based topology optimization approach to design our structure. And we aim to find a structure or st uh, designs which uh, have a minimal end compliance, but also at uh, this end state has a certain safety then against buckling, which is enforced through the following constraint. And also we have a standard volume constraint. So the uh, topology optimization definition is very standard. So I want to dwell more into that, but I can just mention that uh, after we have characterized our design, we can solve our balance equations incrementally using a standard Newton Repson uh, iterative scheme. And then in the end state at operating load, we solve uh, the generalized eigenvalue problems for the uh, set of smallest buckling load factors. Um, and then, uh, yeah, compute our objective constraints and uh, sensitivities using a standard a joint approach. But uh, uh, we also follow for our Seaman and introduce a p-norm of these buckling load factors simply to obtain a differentiable measure, even in the case of uh, coinciding eigenvalues here. So yeah, but I won't go more into details of that, but instead talk about that Actually, there is an issue when one wants to solve a uh, density based topology optimization problems um, and include eigenvalue constraints uh, into them. Since in this density based topology optimization approach, we have the so called fictitious domain, which are the void regions with very low stif stiffness compared to the solid regions. And why this is an issue is uh, readily seen by considering the Rayleigh quotient and also how we penalize uh, our um, stiffness depending on the density. So in the low density values, uh, our uh, Young's models will approach a finite value, wherefore also the stiffness uh, or the uh, different parts of the tangent stiffness matrix will be also approaching this finite value and the Rayleigh quotient in that, that sense will also approach a finite value. And what I mean by that is, that if we have a dense uh, a buckling mode, which is mostly located in a uh, void region, then it, its associated eigenvalue will be finite and can, uh, in the worst case, be included in uh, the sets of smallest eigenvalues that we are searching for. And obviously this buckling mode has not, nothing to do with, with the actual physical mode, which we obtain here for an example, using a conforming mesh. But when we introduce the fictitious domain, these artificial modes uh, show up. So obviously this is something we have to address if we want our optimizer to do what we want, so to say. So there are various ways of addressing this issue. For example, one can think of uh, the idea of using different simp interpolations for the k naught and KG part, which has been proven useful for linear elastic problems. However, uh, and uh, this, uh, yeah, this uh, works well since then the Rayleigh quotient, instead of approaching a finite value for small density value, it will approach a very large value and then hopefully end up outside of the interval of eigenvalues that we search for. But uh, this approach will not work very well for nonlinear problems since we obtain our tangent stiffness matrix by linearizing our residual equation. And then if we then start to alter with the different parts of the tangent stiffness matrix, we will not have the, tangent, uh, the consistent tangent stiffness matrix anymore, wherefore convergence issues will show up in the Newton iterations. So instead one could think of uh, ideas of uh, being able to filter out the physical modes from the artificial ones as done by Gao and Ma, where they uh, divide the nodes of the finite element mesh uh, into two sets, uh, either the nodes that corresponds to low density values or the ones that have high density. 
and then by uh, considering how much of a uh, mo buckling mode is within e either of the two sets, they can distinguish whether it's an artificial or, or a uh, physical uh, buckling mode. Of course, this approach can then be, uh, however, pretty expensive since you do not really know how many of these artificial modes that exist. And therefore you might have to search for a very large set of uh, buckling load factors. So therefore this approach can be quite expensive. As a last resort, one could think of the idea to simply increase the residual stiffness of the void regions. But then of course we have the issues of artificially stiff void regions, which might cause other issues in the optimization. Uh, of course, uh, since the optimizer might want wanna take advantage of that then. So in this approach, we instead, or in this paper, we instead propose the use of the so-called strain energy transition approach, which was actually um, proposed by Wang et al. for dealing with issues, uh, convergence issues when these void elements are excessively distorted. So in this approach, one introduces an auxiliary field here, denoted gamma, which denote, uh, depends on the uh, density values, such that if gamma takes this. Uh, value of zero we are in a low density region and this uh, region or this element then should be modeled using or the material in this region should be modeled using a linear elastic strain energy whereas if gamma takes the values of one we are in the solid and our physical strain energy should be uh, introduced um, and this approach was actually proven to be very useful in dealing with these issues of excessive mesh, mesh distortions so we already had that implemented in our code and then when we started to write down our equations we actually realized by again considering the Rayleigh quotient that this approach simultaneously is able to deal with the issues of artificial bucking modes since if we then go back to Rayleigh quotient we see that the denominator here will approach a finite value for low density values as gamma tends to zero whereas the uh, denominator will approach zero Wherefore, we uh, get this behavior that if a buckling mode is mostly located in a low density regions, its associated eigenvalue be will become very large and therefore not uh, will be included in the set of the smallest uh, eigenvalues. So in this way, we were able to uh, retain the physical mode uh, that you see here in this example. So. What's uh, neat here is then that this approach comes for free in nonlinear analysis, since we either way have to deal with the, the issues of excessive distortion in uh, uh, low density regions. Uh, and if you include buckling constraints, then uh, you will see that this approach then deals with both issues uh, simultaneously. So that's pretty nice we think. Uh, and to conclude this presentation, I just show you a quick uh, um, example of a design we obtain where we design this chubby beam structure here, which is fastened here and here, where we apply a loading here. And by simply increasing them, the safety factor against buckling uh, defined by this parameter S here, we can see that the design uh, encompasses the buckling of this lower beam here by simply widening the structure and introducing these uh, small struts here for uh, stability. So, by that, I thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, I can answer any questions if you have any. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation uh, on avoiding artificial uh, buckling modes. Is there any immediate question? I just have, a, I don't see any at the moment. So I'm starting, I have just a very technical one. So, so these, these, uh, uh, for, for the, the distortion energy, you have a, something like a penalty parameter, this gamma, gamma between zero and one. So, how how is, is do you use some continuation of that, or how is it how is it chosen? So the gamma parameter is basically uh, found from a heavy side uh, function, and there's no continuation that uh, in that you uh, simply choose like the threshold where it's uh, yeah having its uh, uh, hink and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the slope of that in the beginning. So 
Uh, there's no continuation of the okay, so you, or you, the you gamma scheme, but you could have that. Uh, but we yeah. found that it's not really necessary. Okay. So. There's a, another question uh, by Johannes Neumann again. He's asking if you uh, if there are also already any 3D results, and also he's saying that the 2D results look great. <laughs> uh, no, not any 3D results yet, but uh, perhaps in the future. <laughs> We are working with our uh, homemade code, so yeah, we are quite limited in the resolution. But, uh... mm -hmm. Any other question for now? I think we could take another one because we are keeping our delay of five minutes quite constant. It's fine. <laughs> okay, that does not to, uh, seem to be the case for now. So we can also ask questions later still, uh, but for now we thank Anna again for a very nice presentation and we move on to our last uh, contribution of the day, which is uh, by Subayan Day. Uh, Subayan is an assistant professor at the Northern Arizona University uh, in US. Before that, he was a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Aerospace Engineering Sciences at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I think this is also uh, where uh, these, these, uh, the work he's going to present today dates back to. Um, the title of, of the paper is Reliability-Based Topology Optimization Using Stochastic Gradient. Uh, and the paper is co-authored uh, with uh, Kurt Maute and Ali Riza Dostan and appeared in Structural and Multidisciplinary Optimization uh, one year ago. With that, I hand over to the speaker. Please, Subayan, stage is yours. Yeah, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you nicely and also see the slides. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Professor Stingle, for the kind introduction. So today I'm going to talk about reliability-based topology optimization using stochastic gradients. And as you said, this work has been done in collaboration with Professor Kurt Morty and Professor Aliruddha Dustan uh, from University of Colorado Boulder. Now, before I get into uh, the technical details uh, described in the paper, uh, I, I must motivate you like why do, do we want to include uncertainty? Because if you want to include uncertainty in your analysis, the computational cost is going to increase many folds. Now, <clears throat> in the words of uh, Albert Einstein, as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. So for realistic condition, you need to incorporate uncertainty. For example, if you look at the right uh, top right figure, you started with uh, some assumptions while designing but uh, in terms of material properties, manufacturing conditions, use scenarios, et cetera. But in reality, the material properties may vary as well as the, uh, there, there might be uncertainty in the, uh, associated with manufacturing. Uh, and also like you assumed some particular use scenarios, but in reality, it, the structure, whatever you are designing may have some other uses as well. And finally, you may have wear and tear. As a result, your output or the response of the structure you designed may be uncertain. So um, similarly, you can also have some small scale material properties that are not known or model accurately, as well as, as I said, discrepancies often exist between design and manufacture structures. Now, if you see the bottom figure, so you may want to design a simple beam uh, now, um, the middle figure, which actually uh, uh, is showing one quarter of the design beam, but when you manufacture, there might be defects in the joints. Now, if there are defects in the joints, the result may be catastrophic when you try to implement it. And so uh, to address these uh, issues, we must add, um, include the effect of uncertainty in our analysis in order to obtain a robust and reliable structure during the design phase. Now, with that, uh, uh, our approach is like um, uh, trying to address this uh, lack of knowledge and discrepancies between design and manufacturing structures in a probabilistic setting. And in some of these, um, actually, um, in many of these design applications, practitioners or uh, engineers are generally associated uh, are interested, sorry, interested in reliability based design to ensure the probability of failure does not exceed a uh, exceed a certain limit. Now, 
for this kind of problem, we define the optimization as like minimization of a of of an objective j which depends on the design variables theta now this objective is, can be taken as the expected value of some cost function f uh, which can uh, which depends on the design variables theta as well as some uncertain variables xi now you can have some constraint um, like uh, given uh, at the uh, uh, given below the equation in terms of q small q However, in reliability-based design problem, you also have a constraint on the probability of failure, which is shown in the red. So, uh, so here you have basically the probability of failure given a design theta, so PF theta should be less than an allowable limit, small PA. Now, for these uncertain variables, we use known probability distributions. Now on the left-hand side, so basically that's just a schematic of what I just said, like you can, and if you do not include this reliability constraint, you may end up with a design that have a higher probability of failure, but using another constraint in reliability-based design, we try to address that. Now, one of the main challenges associated with uh, this kind of optimizing problem, uh, including uncertainty, is like evaluating these expected values of the objective and the constraints. Now, the standard procedure is, the, is using the Monte Carlo sampling. However, you, you need to use a large number of samples to get these uh, expected values. Uh, now, and, and this, this can end up in a, in, a, in, a, in a high computational cost. Similarly, if you use some methods like perturbation theory, polynomial chaos expansion, sparse quadrature, et cetera, these are not feasible when you have high stochastic dimension. So basically the dimension of xi is high these are not, not so uh, good in terms of computational cost. Now in reliability-based problem, you have additional challenges. Like you need to estimate the probability of failure, as well as if, if you want to do gradient-based optimization, you need to estimate the gradient of this probability of failure, and they are expensive. Now, to address this, we started with an unconstrained optimization problem where the constraints are imposed via penalty parameters, for example, uh, the second term on the right hand um, side of the equation shown at the top, you have uh, kappa C for the constraints and then kappa F for implementing the probability of failure. Uh, now, <clears throat> to address the challenges associated with estimation of the probability of failure, what we do here is we actually do not estimate the probability of failure at every iteration because that is a costly thing to do. So instead we do it at every, M iteration, so M can be 25, 50, et cetera. Now we also use some advanced sampling techniques like subset simulations or, or you use surrogate models. And for the gradient of the uh, logarithm of this uh, probability of failure, we use this approach where we assume that design variables are also uncertain. Now, simply, we can take this as a uniform theta, the design variable theta is uniformly distributed random variable with the lower limit and upper limit as well, like uh, the, the, the boundaries of theta. Now, the supports of theta. So uh, then we use the base theorem to write the probability of failure given a design in terms of this fraction as shown at the bottom, in, uh, at the right bottom uh, in, um, in, in the blue box. So if you look at that equation, you will see the one term that's there, that is the probability density of the design variable in the failure region. Now, now what we do here is we approximate that in terms of this exponential. Now in here, if you notice, you, you have two, uh, two sets of parameters. One is the alpha, the other one is the beta. Now, but, but, but this expression actually helps us, helps us to estimate the gradient of the logarithm of the probability of failure which simply becomes minus this beta parameter. Now with this, we can calculate the gradients and we are gonna use the stochastic estimate of the gradients of this uh, objective of our optimization using only a handful of random samples. Now this uh, small n of random samples to estimate the gradient can be as small as one. And once we get this stochastic gradients, we can do the update of the design variables. Now, <clears throat> the question is, how do we choose this alpha and beta parameter in this approximation of uh, probability density of theta given the failure region F? Now here, what we um, impose is two constraints. One, 
it uh, if it's a probability density function it should integrate to one and also the mean of this um, uh, of this probability density function should be close to the sample mean that we obtain so whenever we get a sample from the failure region we update this alpha and beta parameters again using a uh, gradient descent step yeah so we used it in a, in a few uh, example problems so for example um, uh, like the rectangular beam problem which is a very standard problem in topology optimization now we added a reliability constraint as like the compliance should the, the, the probability of compliance getting a uh, uh, bigger than some c star value should be less than equals to some allowable probability of 0.1 percent now we use the mini best stochastic gradient descent so basically we used eight random realization of the uh, um, uncertain variables um, if, to estimate the stochastic gradients now we estimated the failure probability however every 25 iterations and we used standard Monte Carlo just to compare as well as success simulations or hybrid, a hybrid approach. So basically we are we are uh, using a surrogate model using polynomial chaos expansion to estimate this failure probability. Now, if you, if you see the designs at, at the bottom, you, you can see the reliability based designs are um, somewhat similar. Now, if you compare with a robust design which incorporates uncertainty, however, does not incorporate the reliability constraint. Now that design is shown at the bottom right. And as you can expect, this design has a 2.1% probability of failure, which is 20 times higher than the allowable limit. So the effect of incorporating reliability constraint is very clear in this example. Now this just shows how the results converge. On the top right, you have objective versus iteration. On top left, you have probability of failure versus iteration, how they converge to the allowable limit. Now, if you look at the table below, um, if we uh, took, if, if, if we take the final design and estimate the probability of failure using 10 to the power five random samples, you see the values uh, are a little bit larger than the allowable. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's the, just the artifact of the, using a stochastic gradient based approach, however, we can rectify that by using a smaller allowable limit. So even though, for example, your problem says we have a limit of 10 to the minus three for the allowable probability of failure, in the actual implementation, implementation we can use a smaller uh, value than that, like five into 10 to the minus four, and then we can end up with a final design which actually ensures your probability of failure is less than the allowable. Now, we also used for a 2D L-shaped dream design. Again, the same thing here. Um, the reliability constraint we used, and or we also used a mini batch stochastic gradient descent with four realizations of the random variables per iteration. We again use failure probability estimation every 25 iteration, and the result is shown at the bottom. The reliability based designs are very similar if we use like standard Monte Carlo subsystem simulation or use surrogate models. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the robust design, it has a higher 15 times the probability of failure than your allowable limit. So you need to, uh, the effect of reliability constant is very clear here. Now, again, the convergence of the probability of failure and the objective, and also the probability of failure estimated using 10 to the five random samples shown in the table. Um, now, we also used for a 3D L-shaped beam design. And, um, and the problem is like uncertainty is in load magnitude and material probability with reliability constraint as, uh, compliance value are greater than some uh, specified C star should should probability of that should be less than one percent, and we used only one random samples per iteration uh, to uh, um, it to to be used in the stochastic gradient descent step. And here again, we use probability failure probability estimation every twenty five iteration using a hybrid approach with a surrogate models developed with polynomial chaos expansion, and the designs are shown on the left. Yeah, as you can expect, the reliability-based design has more mass, but however, the robust design has a probability of failure almost 10 times the allowable limit because we actually didn't consider the reliability constant. Now, on the left two plots, you, I have shown here the probability of failure, uh, how it evolves and kind of gets converged to the final value and the objective of, of the optimization. Finally, to conclude, uh, we are often interested in reliability-based design to ensure the probability of failure of the structure does not exceed certain limits. So, now, however, in traditional methods, we generally rely on approximating the limit step function like form and sum. However, instead in this uh, talk, uh, 
uh, I presented a stochastic gradient based approach to get this reliability based design, which are also computationally efficient. And we got encouraging results for this optimization using this proposed approach for two and three dimensional problems. Now, the, the first one is the reliability topology optimization paper using stochastic gradient, and the second one is the uh, is, is for a more general problem for topology optimization under uncertainty. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I should also acknowledge the support from uh, DARPA. Thank you. Yeah, Subayan. Thank you very much for the interesting talk and also for staying pretty nice in time. Um, are there any questions to Subayan? I don't see an immediate one, so I will start again. Can you comment on how precise? So, so looking, for instance, just at, at the expectation of your of your objective, right? You have the expectation of f plus some penalty terms uh, for for the constraints. Um, you're using a stochastic gradient method. You're using like mini batch, so you have a number of samples in every iteration. Yeah. But can you be sure that your approximation in the in the final design is is good enough? Because to, to evaluate that, I would say you have to do like Monte Carlo with many, 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 many more samples to know what really the function value is, right? Your, your design is producing. Am I right? Yeah. So for example, if you, if you, if you um, um, uh, look at the probability of failure estimated in using 10 fewer five random samples, Monte Carlo samples. So what you get ultimately is the probability of failure is slightly larger than the allowable because there's oscillation and stuff like that. So the final design you end up with. So to uh, um, to counter that, what we proposed is like in actual algorithm using a little bit smaller probability, allowable probability limit. So if you do that, you actually get, you actually gonna get, uh, you, you are gonna satisfy the probability of reliability constraint. Now for other constraints, generally, uh, if you use, a, uh, you use a larger penalty parameter, you satisfy those constraints, yeah. Okay. And also like for the final objective value, since like, if you look at the objective, it's oscillating. Now it's gonna oscillate because you are using a small number of uh, random samples yeah. in every iteration, but. But that, that's my point. I mean, what we see is actually not the true objective. That it, it's always the approximation of the objective. Yes, you you have with your, with your with the, the current samples, right? And you you sort of in the stochastic gradients, you throw away the information of the previous iterations, so you do not really get convergence. You can be sure that you improve somehow your your quantity, but in order to say what precisely the function value is, you would have to to do an exact integration, right? To, to, to compute the expectation. Isn't that true? Yeah, but uh, the main concern is like the final, for the final design, if, in, if we use a large number of Monte Carlo sample to evaluate the objective and et cetera, uh, that shouldn't be like too much different from the, this, uh, let's say average of, uh, average oscillations of the last 25 or 50 iterations. Ah, okay. But that we did. So that kind of stays within like, um, the, the the variations of the blue curve at the end, so that we actually uh, uh, exhaustively uh, um, like uh, uh, confirmed in, in in the in the first paper, which is for the general topology optimization oh, okay. on sundry problem okay. using stochastic gradients. Now we also need to satisfy uh, need to uh, maintain like we are satisfying the constraints and also the reliability constraints. Now the constraints okay. are generally satisfied with the large penalty parameters. And yeah, P, you can uh, use a, a little bit smaller PA to satisfy the reliability constraint as well. So uh, yeah, so the main concern, yeah, you are right. Like we but, should- But that answers my question. So yeah. so I, I just wanted to hear that you, I didn't know that it's in the paper, sorry for that. So so that you do this final testing, so to speak with, with more iterations. Okay, yeah, so let, it, let's see the if, there are, if there are other questions still maybe to Subayan. Anybody else having a question? I don't see any hands for now. So as we are already uh, at, at the end of the presentation, there was still a little bit time scheduled for uh, questions and answers in general. So I suggest we can now still have questions uh, to, to all the presentations if there was some question left over. So actually time is running out anyway, but <laughs> if, if there is an urgent question, I, I think we can still do it, have it here. 
Nothing. So so maybe then I have another one to Subayan, last one maybe to fill up the last minute. Sure. So when you do that, uh, you 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 use the surrogate models for the reliability constraints. Does that then say that you reuse information you sampled in previous iterations? Because actually in, in stochastic gradients you would do that, right? But if if you if you uh, build a surrogate model, do you sort of improve it from iteration to iteration by using older information? Uh, um, so as far as I remember, um, we 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 kind of do that. However, so it's it's in a it's, it's in a hybrid based approach. So what we do is like um, we use surrogate models to estimate like which of these designs will be close to the failure surface. Now, if it's too close to the failure surface, so basically there's a tolerance limit for those. We actually run the full model. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, but but yeah, because still the design is moving. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but 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 still, uh, these uh, surrogate mo models are going to reduce the uh, total uh, computational cost for okay. estimating these fa failure probabilities. And uh, uh, for the three D problem, we had to use that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other question coming up for for one of the presentations? That does not seem to be the case. So we are, I would say, perfectly in time. So let's thank all our speakers again for the very uh, interesting presentations and uh, answering all the questions. And with that, we are at the end of the session. So it remains for me to uh, thank also the, the people in the audience for discussing uh, with us, uh, for listening. Yeah. And in the interest of the organizers, I hope we would see you all back in the next top seminar, which takes place on the 20th uh, of December, if I checked it correctly. And until then, uh, stay healthy. Goodbye and see you soon, maybe in person.